I'm Ryan Calamea. Uh, I'm a family law lawyer up in uh, the mountains in Aspen, Colorado. Uh, today, I'm going to be presenting with uh, John uh, Zervopoulos, who will introduce himself uh, next. And we're going to be talking about litigation tactics for uh, parenting evaluators, specifically CFIs and PREs. John. I'm John Zervopoulos. I'm so pleased to, uh, to be presenting here with Ryan. Um, I am a board certified uh, forensic psychologist and also a lawyer. Um, I, uh, I run direct psychology law partners in which I assist lawyers uh, in uh, helping them understand mental health issues in their cases. And I help them effectively manage the work and testimony of experts in helping them write deposition questions, examination questions, motion language, and the like in the role of a consulting expert to lawyers. So we've got a presentation here uh, on uh, that we're gonna go through. Um, as uh, you can see, uh, we're listed here. You can find some more information about uh, us um, as well as uh, a podcast that my partner, Amy Gosha and I have on family law here in uh, the mountains. Okay, so the first thing is uh, we're gonna set the stage. Uh, you know, as most people, um, would attending this uh, understand, uh, you know, we're talking about parenting evaluation. So uh, for our kind of hypothetical or situation, your client's involved in a parenting dispute, the court appoints a child and family investigator or a parental responsibilities evaluation, uh, and you kind of are with your client throughout the whole process. And then the report comes out and everyone goes to the recommendations, they scroll through, the you know 30 40 pages or whatever the report is and it comes out and it's either really good or really bad uh john sound about right for your perspective absolutely or it looks good for the first uh 80 pages and the last two pages don't look so good right so uh john we're in colorado you're in uh d down in texas right now uh, as we're recording this we're dealing with a fair amount of smoke uh, and but it's kind of a, a matter of where exactly is this smoke coming from happens to be that all this smoke from these wildfires is coming from Oregon and, and other places. But can you explain for the audience um, what this uh, cartoon or slide is about? Sure. Um, well, it is sort of Colorado centric. Uh, but here I, we have a, a lawyer cross examining an expert. Uh, Smokey certainly is a is an expert. He even's got his name on his hat. That means he's a board certified expert, and he's opining absolutely where there's smoke, there's fire. But the question there comes: Well, how do you take that apart and know what Smokey is? If Smokey, if what Smokey is talking about is reliable and trustworthy, if he can back up and support that particular assertion right so the procedural options just i'll give a quick overview uh if a cfi was appointed uh you know you can and the report is adverse uh you can obviously talk with your client about getting a pre uh and then the applicable uh statutes uh 1410 127 uh if a pre was appointed uh you can ask for a supplemental pre uh and uh, the statutory language and citation is is there. Um, you can also consider a motion to strike, uh, as John and I will, uh, you know, get into a little bit. Um, you know, it's really difficult, if not um, overly optimistic, to ask the court to strike uh, an uh, evaluator that it has appointed um, on its uh, behalf. A lot of judges see a PRE or a CFI as quote unquote their expert. Um, I've certainly heard judges refer to a PRE as as my expert um, because of the neutral um, nature of, of them. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's a challenge. And oftentimes when you are asking the court to appoint or you agree to um, a particular expert, it's really hard to uh, go after them and say, um, you know, you should strike them. But, you know, you, you, you obviously can do that. There's some, you know, pros and cons. You could certainly get out um, some of the things that John and I are going to talk about, the criticisms that you may have on a, an evaluator in a motion to strike, but um, it, it, it is rare that they are granted. Um, so what else can you do? You can engage in discovery and you can request the evaluator's file. Um, John, what is look under the hood? What, what does that mean? 
Well, you know, basically the, um, the report is, uh, the, the evaluator writes the report, is trying to put forth their best argument. They may not put a lot of negative sort of things in the report that would reflect poorly on themselves. Looking under the hood gets you to see what exactly the evaluator is pulling from their file in order to frame their, their story in the report. So I think it's really important that if you're going to assess the car, so to speak, you really have to look under the hood as well and see how it's running, see what is supporting the, the report's assertions. And we're going to get into specifically where the engine is, where the oil is in terms of a report, and John's going to explain some of the things that he looks for in particular in a, in a file. But um, as the, uh, we'll kind of get back to the slideshow uh, again, but you can obviously do written discovery to the other party and ask some questions that maybe you thought that uh, evaluator missed. Uh, you can do subpoenas, uh, subpoena deuces tecums um, to mental health providers or other people that, you know, maybe the uh, evaluator overlooked. And then obviously you can engage in de um, depositions and, and you can do a deposition of uh, the actual evaluator. John um, helps draft those uh, questions and whether or not you're setting it up for a motion to strike or you want to understand a little bit more, uh, that's certainly um, something that is worth considering. Uh, then obviously you got a work product expert. You can ask another evaluator to comment on and testify about the shortcomings uh, of the report and any sort of work product is going to ask, work product expert is gonna ask for uh, the, the file. Uh, anything else, John, that you wanna mention about um, you know, these, these topics? Sure, I mean, we talked a little bit before about the notion in discovery of making sure that included in the file is the billing statement of the evaluator. I see the billing statement as kind of like a skeleton uh, or an x-ray, maybe is a better way of putting it, of the evaluation. The evaluator in the billing statement, I mean, they're usually charging by the hour and they're not going to give their time for free. So each uh, element of the evaluation will be noted in the billing statement and how much they charge and how much time for each entity is also noted. So you can get a quick x-ray of the evaluation by just going through the billing statement and, and seeing what is there, how much time was spent, and dates and so forth. And I just think that is just incredibly important. Yeah, we'll get into the, the biases, but an example would be that you see a, an evaluator write a report um, and essentially finish and then go through the collateral uh, interviews. Um, that might be an indication of uh, a bias um, or some, some uh, oversight, uh, which we'll get into. Yeah, so, absolutely. I mean, just to quickly note that is that the um, the evaluator will not put in the report that they waited until after they finished all the interviews and and a week before they wrote the report that they contacted collaterals. They'll just say in the report that they contacted collaterals. That's what going under the hood means. And John, you and I worked on a case where the evaluator put dates for interviews for the parties, but then didn't put dates for the collaterals and um, it was pretty clear that that was intended to gloss over the fact of when exactly that happened. But we've got this cartoon. I mean, you, you've got a lot of information in the file and the reports. And the point is, how do you wade through all these technical terms and uh, a lot of information to really kind of get to the heart of the matter? Because oftentimes it can be overwhelming. Uh, whelming. So, uh, John, can you walk us through what is what what does uh, conceptual framework and practical framework what what does that mean? Well, we're going to go through this pretty quickly. It's 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 um, it's detailed a little bit more in the paper that uh, that Ryan and I put together. Uh, but uh, there are two frameworks to consider to look at a skeleton of an evaluation. The first one is the conceptual framework. The second is the practical framework. Now, the conceptual framework uh, comes from the American Psychological Association Gui uh, Child Custody Guidelines. They're currently under revision, so hopefully this will stay in. But I just see this as a very tidy three-pronged definition of, uh, of best interest of the child and what the evaluator should be looking for in their evaluation. The parenting attributes and deficiencies, 
the child's psychological developmental needs and the resulting fit. Uh, in terms of a three-part best interest um, argument, you as a lawyer can, can take that and organize your arguments around that, then go through the various factors that the statutes uh, lay out in terms of best interest, and then come back and summarize there. And you can see uh, where the evaluation may fall short in the analysis of either the first two and whether they are accurately putting together the first two to a set of recommendations to the court about how the court should uh, view the family from there. Right. Um, and, we've, the, and, and we've got in Colorado, I mean, John, your practice is nationwide, so you're consulting with attorneys all across the country. Um, most states, as far as I understand it, use uh, best interest, but in Colorado under 1410-124, you know, we're getting into specific uh, uh, factors, but they can either be put into this general framework. It's just helpful to understand um, you know, the, the conceptual framework, but moving on to the practical framework, walk us through uh, a, a, a parenting responsibilities evaluation, essentially a, a parenting you know, evaluation or report. What goes in from an evaluation um, into the, the, that from a practical standpoint? Well, um, here you see a, a three-legged footstool, and I put that there just to picture what the generally accepted methods are, but it's a nice metaphor for dealing with um, how, the how good the evaluation is. And the way I look at it is that three well-constructed legs makes for a solid footstool. But if one or more of the legs are a bit wobbly, then the footstool starts uh, wobbling itself and may even fall down. So what are the three legs, generally accepted legs? Well, first is interviews. And um, obviously uh, the evaluator is interviewing the parents and the children. Um, questions you might ask is how many interviews were done? Was it just one or two? Or maybe there were several where the evaluator is able to get to know the, the family. How about, were the interviews mostly history taking? Uh, versus really dealing with the court's concerns and also the timing of the interviews. The next leg is the testing and questionnaires. Now, uh, not everyone who does a PRE is a psychologist, which means non-psychologists will probably not do testing, but they will give questionnaires, all right? Testing is what kind of testing was done, how the um, testing results were interpreted and so forth. We'll get into that a little bit later. Um, I put the questionnaires in the second leg because sometimes what evaluators do is they substitute questionnaires for interviews. Maybe they'll do one interview and say, well, uh, the person answered all the questions in a questionnaire. But keep in mind that answering questions when you're at the kitchen table with a glass of wine with someone else filling out the questionnaire is very different than answering questions in person in the office. And, and John, the third leg. And just to go, you know, to John, just to go back on the second, you and I have kind of worked through, um, you know, a lot of the answers to those questions and the questionnaires that are readily available on the internet, right? Exactly, exactly. So the third is uh, collateral sources. What collateral sources did the evaluator consider? Certainly depositions and in pleadings and so forth, but did they talk with teachers, you know, relevant people that they should talk with to get a better sense of the family? Um, and sometimes we talked about before that collateral, that uh, folks uh, will um, not contact collateral sources until the very end. That's a big problem. Now, John, okay, you're an author in, um, you know, for an ABA published book on examining mental health professionals. And this is the question that you really lead off with in, in your book. And it's how do you know what you say you know? So can you explain what does that uh, mean? Well, I mean, let's think again about Smokey, right? In our initial cartoon, uh, he answers the question, well, where there's smoke, there's fire. Well, the question, the follow-up question by the lawyer is, well, uh, Dr. Smokey, how do you know what you just said? What support is there? Uh, case law notes that it's not so simply because an expert says it's so, 
even if they're wearing a hat with their name on it. Okay, so let's talk about the plan. Um, you have uh, the, the plan model and um, you got to go through this in a strategic manner. I think uh, that resonates with a lot of lawyers. So uh, what's your plan? And John, what does it mean when you're dealing with the plan model? Well, it's a systematic way of being able to critique, take apart, understand the evaluator's work and their testimony. Usually as lawyers, what will oftentimes happen is we will get this long report, 80 pages, 90 pages, uh, sometimes longer, and start cherry picking because we don't, it's, it's just too overwhelming. And what you need is a plan to manage that. And the plan is an acronym for psychology law analysis model. And the emphasis here is that you're not just looking for the psychology part of what the expert's saying, but you're also integrating that with case law so that you can make your compelling arguments to the court uh, that combines both um, the law and also uh, the psychology part of the analysis. So before we get into the plan model, though, we have to set the table. And uh, there are two issues to deal with. The first issue is touchstone words. And here we have reliability equals trustworthiness. You know, reliability, that notion has been around for 25 years now since Daubert came out. And there's a lot of baggage around the notion of reliability. What does it mean? This, that, so forth. But in a footnote in Dauber, it equates reliability with trustworthiness. Can the court trust what the expert is saying sufficiently to base their decisions about the family on that? And I encourage lawyers to use trustworthy, trustworthiness with reliability back and forth in both their motions and their arguments. So the court is really focused on what we're really talking about is, can I trust this testimony? The second issue is to look at the testimony or your examination from two key perspectives, the legal perspective and the psychological perspective. Uh, the legal perspective relates to case law, statutes, rules of evidence, things we all should know as we're dealing with experts. The psychological perspective draws from the ethics, practice guidelines, and the professional literature of psychology and the mental health literature. Now, and John, it's um, just, go ahead. And it's kind of like, you know, the, when the law is against you, you, you argue the facts. When the facts are against you, you argue the law. And this is just a reminder that you need to keep both. I think a lot of lawyers, when they approach some of these evaluations, they can get mired. And we'll talk about some of the pitfalls of really digging into the test data and like trying to, you know, wrangle with, with an expert on the test data. Or, you know, if it, you know, you can just really... Uh, focus completely on the law and, and your point as both, um, you know, a board certified psychologist, as well as a lawyer, is that you really have to look at it from both perspectives and know those right. two perspectives to um, effectively uh, engage in litigation when a, a mental health professional is involved. Right. So the next, there you go. Um, so and the way I look at it is that you have to know both the legal and psychological perspectives separately and jointly. Separately, you have to master both, right? But as Ryan was saying, if you just stay with the psychological part, you're going to get mired down in testing and uh, methods and that sort of thing. Just the legal part, you're not going to be making the connection. Well, just show that it, it just happens that um, there is both case law. And, um, uh, and statements from the AP Ethics Code that shows how you can jointly use these. Case laws from Daubert and Daubert informs uh, Colorado Rules of Evidence 702. And the statement there is an assumption that the expert's opinion will have a reliable basis in the knowledge and the experience of his discipline. That is the discipline of the expert. Then look on the other side. Psychologists' work is based upon established scientific and professional knowledge of the discipline. They mirror each other so that if you find deficits on the psychological part, you've got the language there to walk back and find uh, the mirrored language in the, in the case law. And you can put those together to make some compelling arguments. And in the paper, we talk about a couple of other ways that you can do that as well. 
So let's get into the plan model. And we've got four quadrants. Step one is testing the expert's qualifications. Step two, examine the method's reliability. Step three, evaluate the reasoning reliability. Step four, gauge the connections between the conclusions and the opinions. Each one of those steps by themselves can be pretty compelling arguments in either supporting or, or uh, critiquing uh, an expert's issue. Put together, they uh, make up a, a nice way to, in a structured way, to look at uh, whether Smokey knows what he's talking about. So let's look at the first quadrant, uh, expert qualifications. Um, here's a statement from Shrek, a trial court should consider whether the witness is qualified to opine on such matters. Now that's Shrek as an admissibility case, but um, I contend that, and, and there's arguments that um, uh, Shrek lays out a bunch of the Daubert factors and other factors as well to consider. And I consider those basically tools in a toolbox to offer you the um, lines of questions that you can use to um, examine and cross-examine experts. And this is just one of those. So you look at a CV. Uh, in my view, it's important to uh, don't get overwhelmed by the CV. Treat the CV as the expert's brochure. They're not gonna put a whole lot in a CV that's going to be negative about themselves. They're trying to present themselves as acceptable to the court and to others. Uh, you'll also want to look at the training and work experiences of the expert. Um, you know, not all experts who testify in PREs or CFIs are the same. They have, they may come different uh, backgrounds, different levels of training and so forth. You have psychologists, you have sometimes psychiatrists, LPCs, licensed professional counselors, social workers, marriage and family therapists. It's important to know what their background is, their training to give you an insight as to what they're bringing to the table as an expert. So John, we've got the key professional organizations, but to you know, uh, piggyback on what you just went over and we'll, you can explain these organizations. Uh, the example would be that you need to kind of go through the uh, CV and you know pick out has this expert, if it's a parental relocation case, have they written anything about you know, parental relocations? If it's domestic violence, if that is a key component to the evaluation, uh, has the, the, the evaluator, does how much experience or how much training um, have they uh, engaged in on that particular topic? And that's really gonna drive your evaluation or, or rather your examination. So if the expert is someone that is favorable to your client, you're really going to try to highlight and, and bolster that evaluator's credibility and, and to use your, you know, the reliability and the trustworthiness. You want the judge to know this evaluator has experience and knows what they're talking about. But John, what are these key, key professional organizations? Uh, well, we're looking at the American Psychological Association and AFCC, the American Association of Family Conciliation Courts. I think these are key professional organizations for folks doing PREs and CFIs, not only because um, it, most of those folks belong to one or both of these organizations, but even more importantly is that each of these, these two uh, organizations also publish uh, guidelines and standards for how to conduct child custody evaluations, um, how to do brief evaluations, uh, guidelines for forensic psychology and so forth. And the way I look at those guidelines is that even though a mental health professional say, well, they're just guidelines, the way you can look at it as lawyers is to see those guidelines as basically generally accepted and peer reviewed guidance for how the evaluator should go about conducting their work. These uh, guidelines uh, are gone through committees, they're reviewed by experts, they're finally voted on by the boards uh, of delegates of these organizations. So these are pretty compelling um, documents that you can use to critique the evaluator. And knowing that the evaluator belongs to one or both of those 
uh, is um, uh, it can be very good in terms of giving you lines of questions about appropriate generally accepted methods of conducting evaluations. And you know, just a shout out for my partner, Amy Gosha. She did a presentation with Judge Arkin uh, last year for the Family Law Institute. And I believe that those standards were uh, part of the materials that they provided. Uh, but to, you know, John, you have, uh, you know, the standards and professional guidelines, um, you know, the, in terms of how you evaluate, and this is a perspective that you uh, bring to the table. Exactly. I mean, failure to comply with these codes or guidelines is powerful evidence that the reasoning and methodology may be invalid. I mean, there's still guidelines, but again, they're guidelines that are generally accepted, in my view, peer reviewed and so forth. So if the evaluator is going off the rails by doing things that may not comport with guidelines and they don't have an action, they don't have a sufficient rationale for doing so. Uh, that's a problem. And uh, keeping this in mind can help you focus on that. And John, would an example be that these guidelines will provide some um, standards by which, you know, whether you interview a child um, in terms of how old the child is, if an evaluator, for example, doesn't interview or speak with a, a 15 year old that is subject of an evaluation, the, the standards and guidelines say something about that. Absolutely. And what we talked about before in terms of the conceptual model, that came straight out of like guideline three of the APA's child guidance, I mean, child custody evaluation uh, guidelines. And if the evaluator didn't adequately address the parent's strengths uh, or deficits or the child's strengths and deficits, that's something you can point to, not just to in your examination questions, but say, you know, this isn't a set of guidelines that you uh, could have addressed differently and better. Um, and that's one way of using that. Okay, so what's step two of the plan model? So step two is the um, methods reliability. And um, we just went through that before, so I won't repeat what we talked about. But, uh, you know, you have data from all these sources, the interviews, the testing and questionnaires, the collateral sources, how do you put together? And that's the ring there that uh, is the reasoning part. Uh, the evaluator has to be able now to use their judgment and their reasoning to put this together to build a story, their story of the family that hopefully you can uh, help to incorporate parts of into your story that you're arguing to the court. Okay, so step three. Step three is reasoning reliability. And that the segue that was the, that would previously was a segue to that. And there are really four points to reasoning reliability. First of all, distinguish conclusions from opinions. This is so important. Lawyers oftentimes don't do this. I, I uh, um, define conclusions as data that comes from social science stuff. For example, if mom has the depression scale on, on mom's MMPI is is elevated, mom cries a lot. Uh, collateral sources say that she's very sad for whatever reasons, mom is depressed, okay? But the opinions come around the recommendation. Just because mom is depressed, does that mean her time with, her, with the children should be compromised? Well, maybe so, depending how she deals with that, but that's a different question. Here, we're looking at conclusions as what comes from the methodology that came from step two. And keep in mind that these steps all build from each other the qualifications to the methods and now to the reason. Okay, the second uh, point uh, for reasoning reliability is to understand conclusions, all right? Uh, conclusions are making inferences. Uh, a good defin uh, dictionary definition of inferences is conclusions based on evidence and reasoning. Too often time experts try to make themselves uh, look so very scientific by saying the evidence shows this, that, so forth. The fact is, is that they're taking evidence that may be supported by the literature, but they're also using reasoning to develop their story. And Nassim Taleb in a book, Fooled by Randomness, a uh, Wall Street uh, guy, but he uh, made a statement that just has stuck with me since I read it way back. Science lies in the rigor of the inference. 
All right, so we're dealing with inferences there. Now to highlight that, you know, oftentimes we, uh, we look at test results or experts may look at test results almost like a physical x-ray. Uh, let's say there's a broken bone and the physical x-ray shows the break. But psychological testing is not like that. Well, what are test results? Even MMPI test results. Well, here's a statement from the Standards for Educational Psychological Testing, uh, co-authored by the American Psychological Association and two other prominent uh, testing organizations. When making inferences, remember that word we just talked about, about a test taker's past, present, and future behaviors and other characteristics from test scores, the professional should consider other available data that support or challenge the inferences. So again, you know, we're looking at not only the notion of inferences, but that's also talking about, remember the footstool. Uh, you have to look at the collateral data, the interviews and so forth. They all kind of start melding together as the expert is, um, is, uh, is reasoning themselves towards a story that presents their view of the family. Yeah, John, I think that there was, there's certainly a point in my career where um, when I was first dealing with these parental evaluations, that it was very easy to say, well, you know, if, if the, you know, a lot of people will come in and say, well, the other uh, party is bipolar or the other party is a narcissist. Um, I think I probably hear that in about 90% of the cases and, you know, statistically it's, it's around 10%. Um, and so, but, you know, it would be easy for me to be like, well, they, there's an objective test and you just fill out the form and the bubbles and we'll figure it all out. And would you agree that that's just an overly simplistic way of, of looking at, um, you know, those sorts of test data? Absolutely. I mean, again, these are inferences, not just, quote, evidence. Remember, evidence plus reasoning is the conclusions, definition of inference. Um, but um, you have to put it all together. And that's what that slide mentioned. Okay, the third point in, the, um, in part three, reason reliability, is rely on Joyner's analytical gap tests. Joyner is the uh, second case of the US Supreme Court Daubert trilogy. And the, uh, the applicable quote, the relevant quote is, a court may conclude that there is simply too great an analytical gap between the data and the opinion proffered. Keep in mind here, we're talking about inferences again. It doesn't say that there should be no gap because there's always gaps, right? But rather the gap can, it cannot be simply too great uh, for the court to consider it as admissible and reliable testimony. And we'll get into this later on, but the point of an attorney is if the evaluator is generally favorable to your client and you like that opinion um, or the opinions, uh, you want to narrow that gap and right. that you really want to um, look at the file and, and um, have the materials to try to narrow that gap and your examination is going to be conducted as such. The obvious uh, counterpoint is that if you are, if the uh, opinions and recommendations are against you, you want to try to find the, the gap and, and make it as wide as possible so that the judge and, and everyone's just sitting there scratching their head. How did you reach that conclusion or not that conclusion, but how did you reach that recommendation given the conclusions and the data that you, uh, that you, you know, considered or did not consider? And notice too that that gap metaphor provides you a nice metaphor for your arguments to the court, right? Um, and it's, it's a good mindset to keep in mind. And just like the, uh, the uh, three-legged footstool, uh, here's another metaphor that you can use to guide your arguments to the court as to the trustworthiness of the expert's testimony. So the fourth point here is among other ways, and we talk about that in the paper, evaluators hide analytical gaps in the conclusions when they don't actively monitor judgment biases. And several bias, judgment biases that, um, that may affect evaluators, confirmatory bias, a rush to judgment. Uh, they have a notion of how things should be, maybe based on the first interview uh, 
or maybe even based on a conversation they had with both of the lawyers before starting. And suddenly all the data is funneled through that rush to judgment. Hindsight bias, I call it 2020 hindsight. You know, life is messy. If um, uh, a parent does something that seems um, somewhat outlandish and maybe showed some poor judgment as we look back on it, well, maybe uh, a little bit of, I don't want to say forgiveness, but at least some cushion to understanding what may have been going on there would be helpful. Hindsight bias looks back at what happened and tries to uh, say, well, this is what the person should have done. And if they didn't do it that way, then they truly are lacking. Um, availability, availability bias is what I call top of mind bias. Maybe the evaluator went to a, um, uh, a workshop on domestic violence or went to other kinds of workshops on testing and so forth, uh, or they've read some issues in the paper and all these issues are top of mind. And then they get into the evaluation that they are court ordered to conduct. And rather than trying to uh, monitor their bias, uh, what happens is that the, uh, the flavor of the month or the issues that are in their mind given their experience, recent experiences, become the funnel through which they, um, uh, they uh, deal with the data. And that can, be, um, that can be a big problem. Of course, overconfidence bias. This is the, um, uh, the hardest bias uh, to deal with and the easiest bias for experts to fall into. Um, I'm right because I, I know I'm right. This is what it says. And, um, you know, the research shows that we shouldn't be so uh, convincing to ourselves and to others and, and try to lock in uh, what, a, um, uh, what a particular assertion should be. That's overconfidence bias. Okay, John. And then we've got, uh, you know, the reasonable alternative explanations. So, can you tell our audience what, what is this uh, mean meant to to do in terms of biases? Well, this is this is what I call the bias buster. All right, reasonable alternative explanations is keeping the evaluator should keep an open mind to the various explanations of the data that they are taking in throughout the evaluation as they are taking the data in, and if they are actively doing that then they are testing different explanations against, um, against each other. Uh, of course, if, you know, one example might be if you're doing a crossword puzzle, I do a lot of cross, I do crossword puzzle every day, I enjoy that. And sometimes I'll write in a, um, a, a definition or what have you, and I, think, I feel pretty good about it, but then things aren't working out. Well, instead of just moving forward with it, well, I just erase the definition and uh, fill another spot in, uh, in nearby, and suddenly the whole thing changes, right? So there, that's an example of keeping your uh, explain, uh, dealing with re re reasonable alternative explanations. We're now in step four, which is opinions and recommendations. And here's where you take um, the, um, uh, the conclusions from step three and apply them to the concerns of the court and the legal standards. Here's what I feel is the best definition of recommendations anywhere. And in fact, it really highlights what we've been talking about up till now. Recommendations are based upon articulated assumptions, interpretations, and inferences that are consistent with established professional and scientific standards. And you'll notice that the beginning of that um, uh, sentence, uh, recommendations through uh, inferences, is really the uh, psychological perspective, right? Uh, that are consistent with established professional and scientific standards is the legal demand. And so this does so much in terms of pulling together everything we've talked about for the plan model and also shows how jointly we consider both the legal and psychological perspectives uh, when we make demands of experts in terms of their recommendations. Okay, so the next 10 minutes to close things out, we're gonna go through some uh, 
tips and, and thoughts for examinations uh, when you are in court or in a deposition um, uh, for uh, a, a case that you've got a PRA or a CFI. And specifically, um, you know, if you've got kind of a battle of the experts, a CFI and a PRE or a PRE and a supplemental PRE, or you kind of go it alone and, and you need to really bolster that, um, that evaluator's uh, credentials and trustworthiness. And the first thing is you have to understand what, what exactly are you trying to do? And you have to find what your client's narrative is and look at uh, the things that you are going to highlight. So the strong or weak legs, if you know that really matters, if you want to really bolster um, a, a, an evaluator's uh, recommendations and evaluations, then you're gonna really focus on the strong legs uh, on the counter is that you are going to really attack um, or uh, ex show uh, the weak uh, legs in the, in the evaluation and try to narrow, or I'm sorry, widen that, that gap. So if there's a CFI that has not done, um, you know, testing data, uh, you can, and a PRE kind of comes into the case and does the testing data, that might be an example of the CFI uh, has a weak leg when it comes to the three-legged stool compared to a PRE. Yeah, I would agree with that. And, and you know, another way of, uh, uh, of explaining that as well is, you know, Ryan, as you noted, in terms of your client's narrative, you've got a story that you are trying to convince the judge to persuade the judge about your client's, um, uh, about making your client's case. But if the evaluator, let's say, comes out against your client, uh, you know, how do you deal with that? And obviously, one way is to look at the three-legged footstool and see if any of the legs are wobbly and start addressing that. But you can do that and show the negativity uh, or the deficits of the evaluation. And then after you deal with the methodological deficits, go back through the evaluation, not cherry picking, not cherry picking, but finding areas where the evaluator says positive things about your client and then have read them back to the evaluator. And basically what you're doing is using the cross-examination to tell the court your story. You're, you're adding to the, um, uh, the materials that hopefully the court will listen to even as you're cross-examining. Right, and, and the, one of the other points is the qualifications uh, is, and, and I mean, lawyers, judges, we uh, kind of end up falling into this trap of, well, you know, they went to this law school or they went to this, uh, you know, university and wrote these papers. Uh, we have a particular, it's only, it's only human to put people into stereotypes and uh, that hierarchy. Um, and, you know, you want to be careful not to do it too much, but don't just overlook that CV. And, and if the other party, um, you know, whether it be on voir dire or during direct or cross, you might want to uh, delve into that uh, and highlight specific training, um, publications, or research. If your case involves enmeshment uh, or uh, alienation, and that's obviously a loaded word, uh, but domestic violence, drug abuse, substance abuse, you really want to ask yourself through that plan model uh, and then think about how are you going to present that at examination um, when it comes time to, to, to go to court. Uh, we mentioned the uh, professional standards, having a working familiarity or having someone like John help you out in terms of, you know, do, uh, does an evaluation, does it have a weak uh, leg because uh, there was no uh, interview um, of a significant other, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, uh, or a parent, um, or, or, you know, in, in the context of um, how, what shortcomings are there in the evaluation? Anything else, John, that um, before you, know, you move on? Another thing comes to mind, too, is, you know, let's keep in mind that these people are court appointed. You know, the judge appointed them in the first place, which means that maybe part of the goal, certainly not for everyone, but for many of these, um, if you try to go after the evaluator like you're going to nail them, you know, in like a 30 minute a courtroom thing, the judge probably won't go for that. So what is your point? Not only to use the evaluator, critique him enough to, to show the judge that he falls short, 
and then use the, um, the other parts of the evaluation to tell your story. But keep in mind with the judge that you don't wanna necessarily show the judge that the evaluator is absolutely no good. You want to nudge the judge towards your side. So the judge feels safer um, uh, making a ruling that might not totally comport with what the evaluator recommended. So there are several different audiences that uh, you are trying to deal with when you're doing a cross. And of course, on direct, the same thing. Right, so in cross-examination in particular, recognizing and challenging biases, these are something, so if you see confirmation bias, or you look at that CV and you see that the um, professional just wrote a paper on uh, domestic violence, and then you know domestic violence, you didn't see it as a particularly uh, uh, significant factor in your case, but all of a sudden the whole report um, or evaluation is all about domestic violence, that might be an opportunity where you um, really cross examination, cross examine, uh, you know, the professional and and really highlight that and and bring um, that issue uh, up. Um, same thing with the billing statements confirmation bias, or you look at the file and we'll talk about looking under the hood again. Um, but that when you uh, you know really highlight, a lot of judges have heard about these biases, and you can get into not attacking personally the professional. But say, you know, it's understandable. This is that we're all, everyone is subject to biases. And it's, it's a way that sidestep the personal attack where, you know, you don't want to get a PRE and say you can't handle the truth, you know, like a few good men. That's just not going to work. Um, it, but if you kind of tell the narrative of or, or really use lean into a bias, you can say, you listen, you know, they, they're doing the best that they, that they could, but they, were, they came into this, you know, bias. Um, you know, another, uh, another way of handling that, too, is remember we talked about using, uh, considering reasonable alternative explanations. Well, your client's story is a reasonable alternative explanation. So you can use elements of your client's story and in your examination of the expert, see how the expert dealt with those alternative explanations. And you can both show... Um, you know, strengths and weaknesses of the expert, depending on whether you're direct or cross. But also, again, you are showing biases by uh, showing that the expert did not uh, consider um, a key alternative explanation, the one that you and your client are presenting to the court. Right. And the, you know, the point of avoid getting bogged down in test data, um, you know, most uh, evaluators, if, if, you ask for the test data, they're not going to give it to you. They're going to have to give it to a, a licensed mental health professional, someone like John that can evaluate it. But uh, I think it's really easy for, um, you know, you're, you're going to be um, on a losing battlefield if you're trying to lock horns with a, an expert talking about test data. And, and most judges are just going to glaze over when you're talking about specific raw data scores versus it just isn't going to really matter. And you don't want to lose sight of what exactly you're, you're attempting to do, and that's to present your client's story. So when you really get into the test data, um, you know, it, it, you can get really um, afar in the, in the weeds. Um, looking under the hood, John, uh, what do you mean um, by looking under the hood in, in the PREs or the CFI's file? Well, um, it's important to find out what the basis is of what the expert's saying in the report and testify, all right? Um, again, the report is, a, um, uh, is an account of the expert's story of the family, and they're going to say it in a way that uh, supports what they, um, what, how they see the family, whether that support is strong or not so strong. But looking under the hood enables you to say, okay, this is where the expert got this from. Uh, but you know, in that same interview, the parent said something else that is relevant and maybe qualifies a bit about what the expert is saying. Why didn't the expert account for that? And again, it's like, you know, you're gonna buy a, a used car. Uh, you're not just going to buy it uh, because it looks nice and so on and so forth. You're going to take it to a mechanic and say, what does it look like underneath? 
And it's the same sort of notion there. Um, billing statements, we talked about that a little bit before. Uh, again, it's the x-ray uh, or skeleton of the evaluation, whatever metaphor you want to use, uh, but it shows time periods and, and dates for everything that the expert charged for, which um, gives you um, just an immense amount of data to, to put together. Right. And in the kind of final minute here, uh, we've got, you know, Smokey the Bear. Uh, and, you know, you really got to ask yourself just because someone has Smokey on their uh, hat and they um, characterize themselves as, as a PRE or a CFI, you really have to ask yourself, uh, you know, ask the evaluator, how do you know what you say you know? Uh, and hopefully we've at least presented one or two things that can help you in your practice, uh, as well as evaluators. How uh, can you present? Um, and, and do your work uh, to help families uh, move on. Uh, John, thank you uh, for the uh, insights. Um, it's always been helpful. And if you haven't uh, checked out, John has some great books on the American Bar Association, um, and then he's uh, available for consulting. But uh, thanks again for uh, the, the time, John. I uh, enjoyed it. And I enjoyed it as well. It was great. I wish I could be up in Colorado, but um, maybe next year. Indeed. Thanks, all. Thank you.